With the release of uh, UK GDP numbers today confirming the Office of Budget Responsibilities forecasts re released during yesterday's budget of growth of 1.5% year on year and total business investment uh, that we saw released this morning lower than forecast by some margin. What do you make of where the UK is headed in the context of a drop in productivity as announced by Philip Hammond at his budget on Wednesday? Financial markets economist Peter Dixon joins us now uh, from Comets Bank. What do you make of, of yesterday's budget? Well, I think obviously the one thing which surprised everybody was the extent to which the uh, productivity forecasts were revised down and consequently the, uh, the GDP growth numbers. Bad news for revenues and, and Mr Hammond's uh, ability to give anything away was, was constrained by those figures. So on balance it was pretty much a neutral budget, nothing exciting out there. Um, but I think it was primarily a political budget designed to placate his parliamentary colleagues. That, that's an interesting point, actually. Uh, the politics aside, what should a bold chancellor have done? What could they possibly have done in order to give some sort of direction to this economy, which, of course, has the dark shadow of Brexit hanging over it? Well, it does indeed. I mean, I think uh, people like myself have been saying for many, many years that we need to see a more activist fiscal policy. Now, yesterday, at least it wasn't more austerity, so that's a, that's a positive thing. But I'd like to think the Chancellor could have perhaps been a little bit more bold with regards to uh, perhaps giving a little bit more away to public servants, for example, uh, raising the, the public sector pay freeze, a little bit more infrastructural investment and actually some direct funds into, into house building rather than the incentives uh, which, which, he were, which he announced yesterday because there's no guarantee that the money he was he pledged will necessarily find its way into physically more houses. But of course austerity, you mentioned, was planned originally to have uh, seen the deficit written off by now, I think originally by George Osborne's calculations initially. Um, we're now so far in the future that people have pretty much given up on it, haven't they? Well, I don't think it's such a big problem as people make it out to be. I mean, the deficit at the moment is running about 2% of GDP, slightly more. Uh, over the course of the next two, three years, it could fall to closer to 1%. That's, that's fine. I mean, the real thing is, will markets buy into this plan? And it seems to me that they are, because what markets care about, I think, is, is the debt ratio sustainable? Uh, that does seem to be the case. Admittedly, debt's a little bit higher than we anticipated it would be a few years ago. But it is beginning to stabilise, and over the course of the next few years, it should probably decline. I think with a, with a, a sort of debt solvency condition in place, uh, I don't think the market should be too concerned, and therefore I don't think politicians should be either. Much of that is uh, obviously down to how much money they're expecting to come through from, from taxes, presumably, as you look at. If you get lower productivity, lower growth, you get lower movement of goods and services, you're going to get lower capital, you're going to get lower money coming into the coffers uh, for the Chancellor. Well, that's right. And of course, if you look, if you compare the budget forecast yesterday compared to March, I mean, revenues on a five-year view are down by about 3%. So that tells you, I think, the extent to which the slower economy is beginning to make its presence felt. And of course we haven't really talked about the potential Brexit effect because uh, these forecasts were predicated on productivity to a large degree. Um, so it's quite clear that the, the damage caused by relatively sluggish productivity and, and the potential damage caused by Brexit uh, could mean that even these figures are uh, overly optimistic with regard to where the deficit goes. What, what has Brexit done to the economy? Has it put an advanced break on it? Are we doing things less, less of it, uh, less frequently because of Brexit? Or are there some other factors uh, uh, here at, at play? Well, I think there are two things there. I mean, one is, you're quite right, I think there, there are indications that companies are beginning to rethink their investment plans. It's coming through fairly slowly, but as you pointed out earlier, there, there is a sense that uh, business investment missed the, the estimates in the third quarter, that will probably continue for some time to come. But I think the other problem is, of course, that consumers are facing a big hit to their real incomes as a consequence of higher, of higher inflation. And that, of course, is a direct impact of the uh, collapse in sterling, which indeed was a Brexit-related effect. Well, let's talk about that higher sterling. That prompted the Bank of England to unwind the, uh, the uh, uh, liquidity it pumped into the market with that interest rate cut we saw in August 2016 following on from the, the Brexit referendum vote. Uh, so they've taken that back. Where do you see us now in terms of the long term projection for interest rates. Are we going to see gradual increases? But the big question I guess around that is whether or not inflation is going to stay at around the levels it's at at the moment. Well let's, let's deal with inflation first because I, I think that will determine uh, to a large extent what the bank does. I mean I think most people would agree that inflation has more or less peaked at around 3%. Uh, over the course of 2018 I would expect that to fall back possibly to 2.5% maybe below by the end of the, by the, end of the year. So in that sense, the inflation problem begins to dis disappear for the Bank of England. What does it do with regard to interest rates? Well, it kind of waits and sees for at least 2018. Um, I, I think it's uh, concerned about the weakness of, of growth, the uh, ongoing downward pressure on real wages, 
Uh, and of course, it would like to raise rates, but it's going to be a bit constrained in what it can do. So I think perhaps you might get a rate hike uh, in 2019 on the assumption that the economic situation doesn't begin to deteriorate further, but it will be a slow haul with regard to interest rates. The one thing which the bank will have to keep an eye on, of course, is what's happening internationally. And of course, the Fed Federal Reserve is raising rates quite, uh, quite aggressively. Uh, and by 2019, who knows, the uh, ECB could be back in play. And I think that will perhaps force the bank to, uh, to act just to keep in tune with the international cycle. Yeah, um, the backdrop to this is the FTSE is not too far away from record highs. Sterling has been on this uh, gradual grind higher against, certainly against the, the, the US dollar. Um, what are markets pricing in from the British economy? Well, I don't think they're pricing very much at the moment. They're taking a fairly agnostic view. I mean, I think we can discuss the risks all we like surrounding Brexit uh, and the growth outlook. But as you said, um, equities are doing very well. Sterling is a long way off the, the lows that we saw earlier in the year. Um, and that tells me that markets are waiting to see how the Brexit negotiations plan out. There's no evidence at the moment that the, the investors are taking fright. Uh, guilt investors, foreign guilt investors con are continuing to buy, for example. But uh, this all may change uh, if we get to maybe December and there's no sign of a breakthrough on the talks. And certainly as we go through next year, uh, and we get closer to the March 2019 deadline with no indications of a breakthrough, again, sterling looks vulnerable. Presumably, you, much, some of your data is taken up with modelling and uh, the projections. Uh, do you have much on the total collapse of Brexit talks and a cliff edge and hard Brexit? I mean, is that something you've modelled in? It's, it's actually unmodelable in, in conventional right, terms. Course, yeah. But, I mean, what, one of the things we did prior to the referendum last year was you know, conduct a number of simulation exercises um, they are generally suggesting that over the course of a, I don't know, a, f a five to ten year period, you know, output could be around about 7.5% uh, below what uh, we would otherwise have seen. And that basically translates into a, a loss of about, well, almost one percentage point from growth per year. You might see an initial collapse as sentiment falls, and thereafter the recovery is fairly slow. It's a sort of mini Greek type of uh, scenario. And that means uh, the uh, sterling dollar rate at 133 looks rather overbaked, over, over to toppy, I should say. It, it probably does, yes. Um, I mean, certainly my currency strategist and myself perhaps differ, differ to the, some degree as to where sterling will go. I mean, they're a lot more bearish than I am. But I think if the, uh, the, the hard Brexit uh, fall back to WTO rules does indeed pan out, uh, I think their call for you know, 120 or below certainly would not be, uh, be out of line. Yeah, OK, look, it's a pleasure, Peter. Thanks indeed uh, for joining us. Peter Dixon is financial markets economist at uh, Commerce Bank.